for the few moments that are ours to share, I want to talk about when belief is confronted by an unspeakable situation. Not too long ago, during a break, a study break, on one of those late college nights as my eyes were drooping and my attention wavered and wanted to get away from this difficult assignment I was working on, and I decided in order to wake myself, I'd ponder on YouTube, and if anything <laughs> could wake me up, I knew that Kevin Hart, the funniest comedian that I know in the cosmos and the greatest raconteur of the comedian world, and as I perused these video titles, I found an interview with him and Oprah Winfrey, entitled, The Hard Lessons Kevin Hart's Mother Taught Him. And the interview describes Kevin's first decision to join and be a comedian. And he tells his mom, Mom, I want to be a comedian. And she responds, OK, I'm not a dream killer. If that's what you want to do, you have one year to prove to me that this is what you want to do. Six months go by. Kevin isn't making much money, but he's loving it. He's meeting other comedians, making good relationships. Things just were going all right, but he hadn't paid his rent in a month. And his mom asked him, what are you doing? Is this what you want to do? He says, Mom, the rent is due, so I need you to give me the money. She says, have you been reading your Bible? She says, no, Mom, I'm late. I got to pay rent. She says, son, are you reading your Bible? When you read your Bible, we'll talk about paying rent. Another week or two goes by, and Kevin says, Mom, they're at my door. They're about to evict me. Uh, I need the rent money. She says, boy, didn't I tell you, go read your Bible. A few months go by. Knock, knock, knock. They're at his door. The eviction notice is, is on his door. And he says, Mom, I need the money. They're about to evict me. And she says, did you read your Bible? He says, Mom, yes, I read my Bible. She says, then why don't we talk about rent? And he says, Mom, I ain't got time to talk about rent. And he leaves the house in an uproar, goes home, and sits down. Now, if you're any kind of human like me, you can appreciate this frustration because we've all found ourselves so consumed and overwhelmed by the urgency of survival uh, that our faith is challenged. And I believe that is exactly what is happening to the man of this text. The father, whose son was possessed by a deaf and mute spirit, was in a paralyzing predicament. His resources were exhausted, anxiety was building up, frustration is bubbling, patience is wearing thin, and his faith is becoming agitated. He's in a, a position where, with as much strength as he can muster up, with as much uh, uh, tolerance as he can sustain and with his very best effort nothing seems to be working in his favor the problem persists he's literally faced with his belief confronted by an unspeakable situation his son is possessed by a deaf and mute spirit he's speaking to the situation and has, hasn't uttered a word and my question to you is have you ever been there staring in the dark abyss of desolation where tuition is raising like a mighty flood and scholarships are drizzling like a broken sprinkler when you're answered to call the answer to the call to preach and suddenly you can't hear God's voice when you've been solicited for advice and wisdom and you are the one in need of encouragement when you're uncertain about where your next meal is going to come from and it's your insides that start to rumble when it's your family that's in shambles and you're doing your best to keep your head about you and everyone else around you is losing theirs. I'm just asking, have you ever been in a situation where your belief is confronted by an unspeakable situation? But the good news is, we learn from the Father that there are tools that combat this unspeakable situations in our lives. And the first tool is you have to have a stubborn faith. The man brings his son to Jesus. He says, teacher, I brought you my son who's possessed by a spirit that has robbed him of speech, but Whenever it seizes him, it throws him to the ground. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. I asked your disciples to drive out the spirit, but they could not. In other words, God, I've done what was logically necessary to alleviate the problem. Yeah, God, yet in my sickness, I'm going to the doctor office, and I'm taking my pills. God, yet as my children behave, as they haven't gotten any type of sense or home training, I'm still modeling decent parenthood. God, the urge to pick up that bottle, that drug, or that addiction again is itching me, but I'm still attending rehab and take, talking to my sponsor. God, 
Yet as I meet with my professor consistently and engaging in class and studying until my brain oozes from my left ear, the grave is still an inaccurate reflection of my intelligence and my work ethic. God, you see my effort. I'm pressing my way to these folks that you've placed in my life to assist in this time of trouble, but they obviously don't have the power to deliver me from this terrible situation. As a matter of fact, they nor I have the fortitude to hurdle over this obstacle. He says, Lord, I went to your disciples, and they couldn't cast it out. And then in my surprise, Jesus turns to the disciples and says, you unbelieving generation. Now, Jesus, why didn't you respond to the man? I mean, here he is pouring his heart out, and Jesus turns his attention to the disciples. That's a splendiferous question, and the answer is couched in the response of the Father, because he didn't get angry like some of us when God doesn't speak back to our unspeakable situations. He just stood there. And I like to believe that his favorite gospel song was Stand by Grammy Award winning at Donnie McClurkin when he said, tell me what do you do when you've given your all and it seems like you can't make it through. You just stand, yes, you just stand, stand, stand. You just stand, watch the Lord see you through. See, the man recognized the inability of other people. He says, not everybody can handle what you give them. Everyone is not equipped to manage your particular problem. And some people can only bear what's on their soldier, so, shoulders, let alone deal with yours. And I'll pause parenthetically and surmise that there are some instances in which our ministerial power cannot penetrate the places of people's needs because we've got our own pile of mess to deal with. That's what's going on with the disciples. And Jesus directs his attention and asks the first question, how long shall I stay with you? I imagine there's a hint of frustration in his tone because he asked two questions, immediately followed by a command. It leads me to conclude that Jesus was asking a rhetorical question. Jesus had saw the beginning of his final trip to Calvary, right? He was performing wonders and teaching, and this wasn't the only time the disciples in some way had elapsed in their faith. In the previous chapter, verse 18, he says, do you have eyes but still not see and ears but still not hear? And don't you remember when I broke the five loaves for the five thousand? How many pieces did you pick? They said twelve. He said, and then when I broke the seven loaves of bread and the four thousand, how many baskets of pieces did you pick up? They said seven. Then Jesus said, do you still not understand? Even Jesus recognizes people's inability. But I'm so glad Jesus questioned the disciples and didn't cast them away because it lets me know that the momentary inability has not relegated me to a closed cap capacity. That in spite of of my humanity and trepidation in my faith, Jesus will still walk with me and teach me until I get to where I need to go. You've got to have a stubborn type of a faith. But second, you have to ponder the prevention. You have to ponder the prevention. Uh, when I was little, uh, my mom used to uh, get my report cards. And in my report cards, I wasn't always a scholar. So uh, she would, uh, I would rush to the mailbox um, because I knew that if I got there before she did, she wouldn't see uh, my lack of scholarship. Uh, and, and I would run down and get the mailbox, because there were some instances when I wasn't, uh, I couldn't achieve that goal, I'll say. And she'd get it. And I'd get nervous real bad because uh, I knew that what was on there was not an accurate reflection of my grades and my intelligence. And she would get the report card, she'd open it up and see that I didn't do anything well. Uh, she'd read it and say, son, what is this grade? She said, uh, I didn't raise you to be a loser. She said, I raised you to be great. Then I responded and said, well, mom, it's not my fault. All the other kids got bad grades. Nobody passed the test. And she said, I don't care what the other kids got. You're my son. You're my child. Nobody uh, has anything else to do with you and my relationship. I expect a certain expectation from you. And so she tell me, give me your study guide or whatever homework you have. And then she would take it away from me. Well, that's exactly what Jesus does in short when he says, how long shall I put up with you? He says, uh, how long shall I put up with your poor performance? How long shall I deal with your non-having faith self? He says, bring me the boy because you can't handle this situation. So that's what he does. But what does that have to do with pondering the prevention? In verse 28, Jesus walks in the door, or he walks in the door, and the disciples asked him immediately, uh, why couldn't we cast them out? He says, in other words, uh, what is it that I have to do to change? What is it on the inside of me that disables my potential from transformative power? What do I need to do to correct myself to prevent this dilemma from occurring the next time calamity creeps up? You've got to ponder the prevention. But thirdly, 
you got to be committed to outlive your crisis. Jesus asked the boy's father, how long has he been like this? And I had to Snapchat Jesus uh, because Jesus, I'm confused. Jesus, you just came out from the Mount of Transfiguration and prophesied twice of your own death. You've just witnessed what's to come, Jesus. Why are you questioning these men, this man? Surely you know what's going on with him. And I'm still waiting for him to Snapchat me back, but my hermeneutic of suspicion leads me to believe that Jesus is checking to see if the father was committed to outlive his crisis. He says, from childhood it's often throwing him into the fire to kill him, but I've been dealing with this for a long time. Nobody knows my problem than me. And this is my responsibility. I deal with it. If I don't stay committed, he'll die. I have been lost my faith, God, but there's some burns along the way. There's been some scars, and I've been fighting this difficulty and trying to get through my breakthrough. The man says, so if you can do anything, take pity on me, God. And God, Jesus says, if you can, and he says, everything is possible for the one who believes. And at first glance, I thought that was nice, Jesus, but the text says immediately the man explained and exclaimed, Father, I believe, but help me with my unbelief. He's dealing with an unspeakable situation, a deaf and mute spirit. It hasn't killed him, but it's thrown him in the fire. And that's an exciting place to engage in an exegetical exercise because fire and water have symbolic biblical symbolism. Ask Jeremiah. Jeremiah will tell you uh, that it's like fire that shut up in my bones, and, and Jesus will tell you that it's like living water, and they both have symbolic symbolism. But they hold inside themselves, man, destructive capacity. Uh, Noah will testify that, that water can consume and flood the earth. He, he knows that it contains great destructive capacity. Can I tell you, Tyler, that there are elements and systematic uh, mechanisms in this country that have great destructive capacity? Ask Michelle Alexander, author of The New Jim Crow. She'll testify that in the prison industrial complex has great destructive capacity when mass incarceration operates as a tightly networked system of policies, customs, and institutions that operate collectively to ensure the subordinate status of a group defined by a large race, a race and a group that Eric Garner belonged to as he experienced the destructive capacity of law enforcement in this country as breath was stolen from his body and his existence stolen from the family as Sabrina Fulton, the mother of Trayvon Martin, as a witness of the destructive capacity of the, of the media in America as she saw her unarmed son portrayed as a no good thug who provoked his own murder because a black teen carrying Skittles and sweets was a, a, a suspicious, suspicious behavior. Even the parents of an unarmed teen who was killed by a man who took an oath to protect and serve Michael Brown's parents, the United States judicial system contains destructive capacity. And so the man throws his hands up, I've been dealing with destructive capacity. And that's the same issue that Kevin Hart was dealing with. I haven't forgot about the story. It ends this way. Kevin enters the room, is frustrated, and he says, Mom, I'm tired, but he opens up the Bible and out falls six written checks. The whole time she had been inserting his mortgage checks, his rent checks, and that's exactly what happens. And I'm taking my seat now, uh, but I dare you to trust Jesus, because in faith, you'll testify to everyone who's running toward him, because that's when he made his move, when folks are watching, when they're talking about you, because they did declare, I think he's dead after he was already delivered. And you'll have a story and a confession and a testimony and testify to the world that when your faith is confronted by an unspeakable situation, Jesus will speak a word of deliverance and heal you. Thank you.